we'll, we'll continue on um, duality, which is this actually super interesting topic. Um, and what we've seen so far, just to uh, remind you, is we take any optimization problem at all, convex or not, and we form this thing called the Lagrangian. And you can mumble about how, you know, what's the Lagrangian? You go, well, it's a way to kind of incorporate the constraints into the objective, right? And you can mumble about like, oh, that's the market-based thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, they could do this. Um, and it's got these mysterious weights, which is how much you weight the constraint functions in, in forming this Lagrangian, which is this thing that includes uh, some costs or whatever or additional terms from the um, objectives. Uh, sorry, from the uh, constraints. So that's the Lagrangian. And then from that, we get a dual function. And to get a dual function, you minimize over x, right, the, your, your uh, variable. And that gives you this dual function, which is a, a function of these Lagrange multipliers, right? And then we observed that this gives you a lower bound on the optimal value of the original problem. Everybody, so just, just to recap where we are, right? And so you can even think of that as a parametrized lower bound on the optimal value. It's parametrized by lambda and nu, right? Um, and so in other words, for any lambda and nu, you get a lower bound. Now, by the way, in a lot of cases, if you just throw in random lambdas and nus, here's the lower bound you get, minus infinity, right? But that's kind of a universal lower bound and is utterly uninformative, right? But in other cases, it's not, what you get is not obvious at all, okay? So here's an example. Um, so this is the, the partitioning problem. I think we talked about it uh, last time. And it's, um, it, it's not convex for a couple of reasons. Number one, we didn't say that W was positive semi-definite. So your objective does not have to be convex. And then the other one, which makes this very much not a convex uh, problem, is that we have, uh, we have a square equals one, uh, and you can't do that. In a convex problem, equality constraints must be uh, affine. Okay, so, so that's the problem. Um, and here what we're gonna do is work out uh, the, the, uh, the dual function for it, right? And uh, to do that, we, we simply form, this is the Lagrangian here, and we minimize this over x, right? And when we minimize it over x, we find out that it's a constant plus this thing, which is a quadratic form. And the minimum of a quadratic form over x is either zero, if that, if the quadratic form is positive semi-definite, I mean, that's clearly the minimum, right? Or if that, if that quadratic form, if that matrix has one negative eigenvalue, the minimum is minus infinity. It, then it's, at that point, it's game over. It's minus infinity, okay? So you end up with a very interesting uh, lower bound. Um, it, says, it says that, you know, if you come up with some vectors, uh, sorry, a vector nu or some numbers nu i, and Provided this holds, if you can take your original matrix, right, add this diagonal matrix, and if that's positive semi-definite, then minus one transpose nu is a, is a lower bound on this problem. That's actually super interesting because actually solving this problem is exactly is extremely hard. Um, good news is you almost never have to solve it exactly, right? So I'm not too concerned about that, right? I mean, for one reason, if you're doing partitioning, uh, that, you know, somebody made up these W's, right? And then if, if you say, I've, I haven't solved it exactly, you know, someone would say, oh, you, you have to solve it exactly. Then you just, you say to them, where did your W's come from? And they tell you, and the truth is usually they just made them up, right? That, that's, I mean, you know, not like the sign is generally right, but generally they're just made up. Okay, so, so it's not that big a deal in practice that you can't solve this problem exactly. Um, and let me just give a, a, a quick, there's a lot of heuristics for this. Uh, I think I even mentioned one last time is based on spectral partitioning, but there's a lot. And the other thing is you could write like a super dumb, greedy method. This like the dumbest thing ever. Here's my method, ready? I'm just saying this is kind of if you were doing street fighting stuff and you're at an internship or a startup and you need to do this. Well, what you'd really do is you'd go find some stuff on, on uh, GitHub or whatever and start from there. But the point is, what you might do for something like this is you initialize x with a random plus minus one vector. Everybody got it? Now, here's my algorithm. It's incredibly dumb. I cycle through the, ind the indexes, one, two, three, four, and I simply ask myself, if I flip the sign of x7, will the objective go down? If it goes down, I take it, and I keep going, and I keep doing this cycling through until this is stationary. Everybody got that? Then, if I want to write another, like, four lines of code, I could start doing things like this. 
I'll look at pairs and think about simultaneous swaps, right? And cycle until there are no pairs that improve the objective. And then I guess in the in the I guess in the um, I guess it's called in I guess computer science refers to the first one as one opt, and the second as two opt. One opt means that there is no change of a single variable that will improve your objective, right? And the second one is two opt, right? There's no change of any two variables that would improve your objective, right? It doesn't mean you're optimal. It just means you're, lo you're locally optimal in this discrete set, which is, uh, 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 anyway, everybody got that? So, okay, methods like that actually often work really well, right? Then what's interesting is then, I mean, sometimes you don't care. Like you just, you put it into some big old project and like everything's working and it's really cool and no one really cares, right? You test it a little bit, you make some, you know, that kind of stuff, but you know, no one really cares. But you might ask like, how far from optimal is it, right? And then it would be something like this that would give that would give you that would give you a a very uh, I mean give you in some cases a pretty good bound right I mean of course it depends on your quality so but what happened is you'd say well I have a heuristic runs in fifty milliseconds uh, and you'd say oh yeah well I mean on this problem instance what value did it get you go oh I got this thing down to um, you know three point two and you go okay well that's cool um, how how far from optimal is that. And you'd go, yeah, well, I came up with a, a lower bound, provable, that says no one could do better than 2.7. Everybody follow this? That's actually really useful because it means in that project, I mean, you probably don't need to someone, you don't need someone to go in, in there and improve your partitioner. They should focus. Everybody seeing this? I'm just saying this is, these are already like super interesting and practical things. Okay. Um, so there's a strong connection to uh, things like uh, conjugate functions, right? And to see that, just can, this is just a completely generic, uh, that's, a, that's just an optimization problem, not convex, by the way, it doesn't have to be, right? This is not, not a necessarily a convex problem, it's got linear equality, linear inequality constraints, so you have a polyhedral uh, feasible set. Of course, that's convex, right? That, that's fine. And we have a, an objective we want to minimize, right? So if you work out the dual function, it's, well, it's F0 of X plus the Lagrangian is F0 of X plus, uh, this is gonna be here we write eight, uh, here I, I write this as, um, yeah, we're writing it all in terms of uh, lambda, uh, sorry, X. Uh, this is lambda transpose, you know, AX minus B, and then plus nu transpose CX minus D, and, and that ends up with, you write it this way. And then here, we have to minimize over X. And a lot of stuff floating around here, but here's what you see. These terms don't depend on x at all. So we don't care, they pop out of the uh, infimum, right? Um, then this thing is minimize a function plus a linear function, right? Well, that sounds familiar. As a matter of fact, it's, it's like the conjugate. So unfortunately, the conjugate is you're maximizing a linear function minus your function, but if you, that these are the same things with the appropriate changes of sign, right? So what it says is this thing uh, is, like is that, right? So there you go, the so the conjugate just came right out of the, uh, as, as a portion of the dual function, okay? Everybody got this? So, so this is actually quite useful. Um, if, you know, you have, so here, here's a problem. If I take this thing, this one's convex. Suppose that's my objective. This is the negative entropy. And for example, uh, that'd be a super interesting problem. X might be a probability distribution on some, on N items, right? Presumably, uh, over here, we have one transpose x equals one. And somewhere over here, we, well, actually, we don't need that because the domain of this says x is, all, all the x's are non-negative. Um, but then the other in it, it constraints here are basically the, uh, this would tell you there are expected values of functions whose value is given. And this would say there are inequalities, right? So I could, I could, bow, I could say, oh, you know, the second moment is this. Uh, the probability that X is, you know, satisfies this is, is 0.2. Oh, the, oh, by the way, you know, the third moment lies between this number and that number, something like this, right? That would all be this. And then this problem would be finding the maximum entropy distribution consistent with your, your, uh, your, your requirements on these expected values. Everybody got that? I, I mentioned this just because that's actually like quite a real problem. Okay, so, um, okay. So in this case, um, I mean, you could go through all, the, all of this, but there's no reason to because 
you just go and I go to Google or something and, and type in conjugate of uh, negative entropy and you will find out that it's just this thing, right? And then that means that uh, the dual function of the, you'd say it this way, the dual function of a maximum entropy problem is a convex optimization problem that involves exponentials, right? Um, but by the way, um, I mean, not th that, that, that should actually strike a chord to people in statistics because it's a connection between maximum entropy and uh, exponential families. If you know what I'm talking about, fine. And if you don't, that's fine too. So, but just if you know about that stuff, right? And in fact, there's a lot of uh, duality and conjugates and things floating around in, in those areas. Okay. Okay, so let me first say where we are. So, let, so here's where we are. Uh, we have a method where you have any problem at all and we can form, we form this Lagrangian, then we form dual function. And someone says, what's the dual function? And you go, well, it's a, it's a lower bound on the optimal value of your problem. You go, okay, cool. So then the most obvious thing in the world is you'd say, well, what are these lambda and nu? And you go, oh, there's parameters. And you go, well, what do they do? And you go, oh, yeah, for different ones, I get different lower bounds. So, but this kind of like, you, what you obviously want to do is find the best lower bound, right? I mean, that's, you should have an urge to do that uncontrollable urge to do that. And that leads to this problem, and this is called the Lagrange dual problem. And so what it says is, you know, G of lambda nu is this lower bound on the optimal value of your original problem, which might not be convex, which is interesting, right? Then, um, uh, then this says, this says find the largest lower bound on the objective that you can find, on the optimal value of the original problem using Lagrange duality. That's, that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's how you'd say this in English, right? Um, here's what's cool. This is actually a convex problem even if the original problem was not. Okay, so that's, that's actually kind of interesting. So uh, here's an example is, you know, here's a, here's a so-called standard form linear program. You minimize a linear function subject to equality constraints and non-negativity. And then you'll remember that we worked out the dual. By the way, this is not quite the dual. The dual here would be maximize a function that is, you know, minus infinity uh, unless you satisfy, you know, this and plus infinity otherwise. So I've done a, a few innocent translations, you know, uh, translations of the problem here, right? But this is, so what it says is these two LPs are intimately related. That's what it says. It says, in fact, they are, they are uh, duals. Actually, the name dual suggests like conjugate. It's something that if you kind of do it twice, you get back to the original. And like conjugate, that's kind of true. Uh, but I mean, in some cases, right? So we would say these are dual LPs. Make, make sense? And it's not, ob I mean, these things are kind of not obvious. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so now we talk about weak and strong duality. So the first thing you have is this. Um, so D star is the optimal value of the dual, and that means it's the largest lower bound on the optimal value of your problem that you can find using Lagrangian duality. So that's what D star is. P star is the actual val is, is the actual optimal value of the problem, right? Oh, and by the way, perfectly cool to have either, either or both of those be infinite, right? So for example, if D star is infinity, then P star has to be infinity. And basically that's a certificate telling you that that tells you that the original problem is infeasible. Okay, so, all right. So this holds no matter what, that always holds. Convex problems, non-convex, there are no pathologies, no exceptions. It just always holds. That's weak, that's so-called weak duality. And you know, it's based on these very deep mathematical facts like the product of two non-negative numbers is non-negative. And if you add two non-negative numbers, it's non-negative, right? So, it looks like fancy and you can make it sound fancy and weird and mystical and say, well, duality is this bit. But the point is it's based on just nothing, just the simplest of things. But now it gets interesting. Um, so strong duality is when these two are equal, right? So it says, it says there's actually, strong duality says basically there, you, you can get, you can actually find dual variables whose associated lower bound on the optimal value is actually equal to the optimal value, right? Um, this is strong duality. Now that, that in general doesn't hold, but here's the cool part. It usually holds 
for convex problems. And in fact, I'd even strengthen that. I would say that in, in all practical problems, convex problems, it holds. All. Uh, are, there, are there convex problems for which it fails? There are. But if you encounter one, you better actually be, go back and ask yourself. I mean, for, number one, you're not going to. Okay? But if you did, actually, what's much more likely is some annoying person like who works with you is going to say like, well, how do you know, like, you know, how do you know it, you have zero duality, strong duality, right? In which case you just tell them to go away. So, uh, so, but if you, if, if you were to encounter uh, one of these uh, pathologies, you would need to rethink your whole, you're going to have to rethink what you're doing because you're doing something wrong. That's basically the right way to say it. Okay. So, okay. Now, uh, to, to know that strong duality holds, you actually have to add some, uh, usually some constraint. These are called constraint qualifications. There's entire books on these things. Um, you could take entire courses on nothing but, you know, constraint qualifications. And somewhere around the 150th page of these books, you see this big old thing and they have the people's names, like, you know, so it's Slater's, qual you know, method and this one and that one. And you would see like, you know, which implies which and stuff like that, which is all fine. This is all, I'm not, I'm, I, I was tra I'm trained in pure math. So I, I, I have, so I'm allowed to say things about math. But it's totally fine. I'm not hurting anyone. Right. Um, but it's not something I think uh, normal people need to worry about, to be perfectly honest. Okay. But we'll get to that. So here's an example where um, this is actually super interesting. Uh, this is where, you know, first you write your three line thing, your greedy thing that does partitioning. You test it, have a bunch of, it passes all the unit tests. You plug it into the big system. You're a hero. It works. It's fast. Um, and then at some point you're bored and someone says, well, how, how far do you think you are from the global optimum? And, you, and the answer is you don't know. But what you do then is you solve this convex problem here, right? Um, that's actually a semi-definite program, right? You, and that'll, that, that will give you a number and you compare it to the number that your greedy algorithm is producing for partitioning. And if they're reasonably close and, you know, guess what? course they're, they're going to be reasonably close then you then you declare actually it's kind of cool then you just set that aside and wait for somebody to say hey how do you do your partitioning and you go huh, four line greedy algorithm or whatever you whatever you do you know i do spectral partitioning followed with a four line greedy algorithm and they go how does it work and you go really well thanks and then, they, then if they're annoying they would say yeah but that's you know that's not convex how far are you from the global optimum right probably the correct answer to that is who cares? And please go away because I have actual work to do. Or, but that's probably the right one. But you could say, oh, funny, you should ask that because I actually solved the dual problem and I found out I'm typically about five, five to 10 percent at most suboptimal. Everybody see what I'm saying? So, okay. Cool. So here is, um, this is probably the most famous constraint qualification. It's, I guess, uh, for people who actually study these things, this is the sledgehammer, right? So it's just like, it's just a, this is sledgehammer. It's just basically like this will do the trick. Um, it's this. And it basically says that uh, strong duality is guaranteed for a convex problem, provided um, there exists a point where the inequalities hold strictly. Now, there are lots of problems where that doesn't hold, and yet strong duality is just fine. Okay? So, um, and you know that there's you for example linear inequality it, you can excuse the linear inequalities from this requirement right that you know, linear inequalities do not need to be satisfied uh, strictly right um, and there are a gazillion other types of constraint qualifications so if you get into a weird mood you go to Google or Wikipedia and type constraint qualifications um, if I mean if you're if you're interested in that okay so these are um, so let's let's look at um, Something like, let, let's just look at a couple of examples. So here, here's, an, here's an inequality form LP. It says, minimize C transpose X subject to a whole bunch of uh, linear inequalities, right? Then the dual function uh, is, well, you just form the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is going to be C transpose X plus lambda transpose AX, uh, AX minus B. And we rewrite that this way so that we see it's an infimum. That's an affine function. And we know what the infimum of an affine function is. It's usually minus infinity. But if the linear part of the affine function vanishes, then it's whatever the constant is, right? So this is that. So the, the real dual problem is this, is maximize 
this function g subject to lambda bigger than or equal to zero. That, that's like the true or literal dual problem, right? Then what we're going to do is here, our objective is going to have, you know, has, has implicit or hidden uh, constraints. In this case, you know, this equality constraint. If we make that explicit, you would write the dual problem this way, right? And, and that, would be, that, that would be it. Um, so that's kind of cool. I mean, it, what it says is, uh, it says the following. It says that this linear program is like very closely related to this one, right? And we can say all sorts of stuff about it. Number one, if you have a lambda that's feasible for this problem, so it's, it's non-negative, satisfies this equality constraint, then this number is a lower bound on the optimal value of that one. Right, that's, that's number one. Um, number two, uh, actually, in this case, you know, Slater's condition is that this should hold... Well, okay, the stronger form of Slater's condition says that if you have linear inequalities, you don't have to... There is no, there, there is no requirement. So, in fact, this one, you have strong duality all the time, except in extreme, extremely pathological cases, right? Where, in fact, you would have d stars minus infinity and p star equals plus infinity. So they're both infeasible. Uh, this, and you have to construct these. They're extremely small and silly. And, but at least now you know that it can happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, OK. Um, and what's cool is there is actually, you know, if you solve this problem, there's actually a lambda, which is feasible here. And this number is equal to the objective there. And that gives you a certificate of optimality which is awesome. As a matter of fact, what we're going to find is when you solve this one by most methods, whether you like it or not, it is going to give you a lambda here. So that's really cool because it says when you, sol when, you call the when you solve an LP, it comes back and it says, yeah, okay, here's X. You check it's feasible and you see its optimal value. Or sorry, you see its value. It, you also, it also returns a completely independent checkable proof that no one no feasible point could have an objective value smaller. Everybody see what I'm saying? This is like super strong, right? In numerical computing, this is very rare, right? To get something like that. So, so but that's actually what all, all solvers do. It's kind of cool. They return both a point, a prime, what's called a primal optimal and a dual optimal. And that the dual optimal serves as a certificate of optimality. So and these are kind of very cool things, right? Okay. Let's look at another example. Here's a quadratic program. So here's the primal problem, right? So you minimize a quadratic over a polyhedron. And we work out the dual function, and it looks like this, right? Um, and so the dual problem is this. And what it says is that, you know, this problem and this problem are intimately related. This says, you know, any feasible lambda here, this number is a lower bound on the optimal value of that. Right, so that's, that's what this says. Oh, by the way, um, any feasible point here is an upper bound on the optimal value of uh, the objective of any feasible point here is an upper bound on the optimal value of this. I mean, of course, right? So, um, okay. In this case, you, know, you don't even need, again, these are linear, so Slater is, the, the strong Slater says you are excused from checking Slater's constraint for linear inequality constraints. And in this problem, there are no exceptions. It's just P star equals D star, right? So, um, Okay, so this is, this, is, this is kind of the idea. But by the way, this is a stunning place to get to. Because you were, if you remember how the whole story started, it started very implausibly, right? Here's how, the, here's how this whole thing started. The whole thing started this way. You say, well, I have inequality constraints. And so here's the semantics. Here's f1 of x. It's like 0, 0 if you're less than or equal to 0, and plus infinity if you're positive, right? So we said, yeah, that's, 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 that's the problem I have. And you go, oh, cool. Do you mind, may I approximate it? And you go, yeah, go ahead, please. And you say, well, I'm going to approximate it with something that looks like that. Then you look at that and you're like, dude, that's not a good approximate. I mean, that's not a good approximation, right? I mean, it's not. You know, if someone had drawn a, you know, something that looked like this, you would say, okay, that's an approximation. But I, there's, I don't know how anyone could ever say that this is an approximation. Ever. So if you remember, this, is, this was the start of the story. And it is deeply implausible. And here's what this says. What this says is that, weirdly, if you adjust this correctly, then very weirdly, 
you actually get, you will actually kind of get, I, I don't want to say get the solution, but you'll get the, op, the, the optimal value of the original problem. Is that, so in other words, it looks dumb, but it turned out it's actually, at least for convex problems, it's not as dumb as it might appear at first, right? Everybody got that? So it's kind of, it's, I don't know, I've, I find it kind of interesting and cool. Um, and we'll have it, we'll see a, oh, actually, I think I'm going to, I'm going to skip this and just say the following. Um, there are a number of non-convex problems where people know that there's, that strong duality holds. Okay. And a famous one, we don't have to worry about this, is actually when you minimize a non-quadratic, uh, sorry, a non-convex quadratic subject to a quad over, let's say, a unit ball, right? So turns out in that case, and it is not easy to show this, you have, it's, you have strong duality, right? And that's actually super interesting, right? Because um, anyway, so by the way, this is actually used by some, I think, kind of weird people to argue something, which I'll explain. So the, the general idea is this. The implication of this is that any optimization problem with two quadratics, convex or not, we can solve tractably. Everybody got that? Now, you know a bunch of them, right? Eigenvalue problems, singular value problems. If I walk up to you in the street and say, I have a symmetric matrix, please, you know, maximize X transpose AX subject to X transpose X, you know, equals one, you can solve that. That's, that's an eigenvalue problem, right? And, and you say, oh, is that an approximate solution or a heuristic? And you'll, no, that's the global solution. And they go, oh, is your problem convex? And you go, actually, it's not. Everybody see what I'm saying? Okay. So, uh, so people, I think, I mean, it's, it's okay. It's, it's all right. So there are people who say that uh, any problem you can solve, like anywhere in optimization, is because it's convex. That's a very strong statement, and it's weird, but it's also partly true. And so you start asking questions like, hey, in my computer science class, you know, my baby computer science class, I found out that we can tractably find the shortest path in a graph. Well, guess what? It turns out that the relaxation of that um, can be proved to be uh, tight, right? So there's zero duality gap for that. I mean, I think it's silly because it doesn't really do anything for you. You go, oh, should I fire up like CVXPy and use a linear programming solver to find the shortest path? You're like, no, you should use the shortest path algorithm that, of which they have a lot and they're really good. Use Dijkstra or something. Everybody following this? Then they say, yeah, but I don't, I, it, I, the other problems I can solve is I, I can solve these extremal problems with matrices, like eigen, I can solve eigen problems, right? And then all this says is, yeah, you can solve eigen problems because the dual of your eigen problem is A is convex and B has strong, strong duality holds. Everybody see this? So it's a stretch, but technically it's true. So um, it's an extreme point of view, but it's not a bad one. I can't think of any, any problem in any apl applied mathematics field you can actually globally solve where, you know, somehow secretly behind the scenes, convexity is not lurking, right? Um, maybe it's one of these things. Anyway, so it's just good to know. Uh, the two quadratics thing, that's a very good thing to know. Very few people know it. Um, it is rediscovered approximately every 10 years in each of like 10 different fields. So as we speak, someone is figuring out that they can solve this problem, writing a hideous paper with terrible notation that's 25 pages, and think that in their field, they just found some deep thing. So, and it just keeps happening. It's there's even a paper written on the rediscovery of this fact, but a, hist a history of it. So, I mean, it's actually, but it's, it is a really good thing to know, and it is not impossible that you will bump into it someday. Um, there are also even weird sick, sick, sick things that also have zero duality gap. And they come from like weird deep things in math. Like I, there's one where you have, you know, instead of a, a quadratic, you could have like a quartic in six variables over the complex field. That, that would actually have zero duality gap. And the reason would go back to some, you know, very deep thing about, you know, whatever uh, geometry and stuff like that. And it's, you know, algebraic geometry and you're like, okay, fine. So there's, there are isolated cases where non-convex problems have zero gap. Okay, that was all weird and you, not only can you forget that, I'd even kind of su suggest forgetting what I just said. So just cause it's just weird. Okay, um, so now we're gonna do a geometric interpretation. 
Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to do it, we're going to solve a problem where you minimize f0 of x subject to f1 of x less than 0. This is a non-convex problem. And we're just going to, this is a way to visualize what, you know, p star and d star are and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so, so what g is, so g is going to be the set. Remember, x could be in dimension 100, doesn't matter. But g is the set of pairs of constraint function and objective. Right, so that's in a plane. We can plot that, and that's what we have here. So these are, if you if you imagine going over all possible x's, you get this blob, which is g, right? Um, and then let's let's talk about that. Well, this this axis is f1, which is your constraint your constraint uh, function, and basically the semantics is everything to the left is acceptable. And everything to the right is completely unacceptable. So all of these, the x's corresponding to all of this, completely unacceptable. These are cool. Okay? So, so that's what the constraint says. It says ignore the right-hand side. Or, sorry, you're not allowed to look at the right-hand side. I mean, you can look at it, but they are not candidates. Okay? Now, the vertical axis is actually the objective. And the semantics of objective is extremely simple. The smaller it is, the better. And so, graphically now, I can tell you precisely what to do. It says, when you see one of these blobs, you ignore everything on the right, and you can attach a comment to it saying they're infeasible, right? So you can only focus on this thing, this part, and then there, your goal is to find the thing that is lowest, has the lowest potential energy, let's say, right? And that would be this thing here, right? Everyone got that? And so, if we go over here, we'll plot P star on this axis, and that's P star. Everybody. Makes sense, right? So that's that's the picture. Okay. Now, now let's do let's look at the dual function, which is actually kind of interesting. So the uh, let's look at the 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 Lagrangian. By the way, is a function. It's a, of course it's a function of x, which is has dimension one hundred, which I just made up. But right. But the point is, it actually only the Lagrangian only depends on two numbers, which is f one of x and f zero of x. And in fact, it's silly. It's just it's just f zero of x plus lambda f one of x. Okay, that's that's the Lagrangian. So I can plot the Lagran the level curves of the Lagrangian, and they look like this. These are the level curves of the Lagrangian here, and I think the slope is uh, let's see, the slope is maybe minus lambda or something like that. Um, I think that's it, or minus one over lambda. It's maybe minus lambda. So so this is the level. This is for one value of lambda. This this is this is a, a this is a level curve of the Lagrangian, and I would I would have they would look like this, right? And so you, your goal is when someone fixes lambda, which is the slope, your goal is to go as far as possible this way until you're still touching g. Everybody got that? Okay. Uh, and so you can see I've, I've plotted it for what happens for different values of lambda. Um, and what, hap what you can see what happens, it turns out when you take this line, when it just touches, where it intersects this axis, that's actually, this is g of lambda. And look at that. Sure enough, g of lambda is bigger than is less than or equal to p star. We knew that it's a lower bound, right? And now I can picture in my head fiddling with lambda, right? If I made lambda like super big, let's say, well, let me let me first figure out what it is. Um, yeah, sorry. If lambda is super big, that means that the slope here is is extremely small, right? And then you can actually see, in fact. As lambda goes, to, you, you're going to get uh, you're going to get a value around here, d star. Uh, sorry, that's d, right? Now, as I as I change the slope like this, what's going to happen is this is this this intersection point is going to move up here, right when it's just touching these two points, it's going to hit d star. And when I increase the slope again, what happens is my point of contact is here is going to rotate around that point of contact and start going down again. And I just at least visually traced out what G looks like, right? It goes goes up, hits a maximum, then goes down. Well, it's concave. We knew that. Everybody got this? And now, this for this problem, that's the gap. That that's that's the gap. Is this this thing here? It's p star minus d star. So this problem, and now you actually see why you have a gap. You have a gap because there's a dent in this set G, right? Meaning a non-convex portion. So like if G were convex. You wouldn't have that. You wouldn't have this, right? You, you see, everyone see what I'm saying? So now you can. This picture, once you internalize it, you will. You can kind of see why it is that for convex problems, there's zero duality gap. 
Uh, roughly speaking, what it says is you, that, that what, it's a surface. It's going to not be exactly G, but it's going to be closely related to G. It says that that, that, surf, that, that set is convex, and there's gonna, you, what you're going to do is you're going to be able to get a hyperplane right up to it to any point on that surface, and that's, that's what's going to allow you to get zero duality gap. So, again, this is just for you to understand why, this, why all this stuff works, right? Um, okay. That's the geometric interpretation. So to actually make this official, what you do is uh, in this setting, we have F1 and we have F0, right? Um, F1, we want to be less than or equal to 0. And F0 will take as small as it can go. So if I form, it's the epigraph of that. So if I take all the points, that's A, is everything that's like that, it's actually going to be the same, same thing. Because, I mean, actually, these are just points. Yeah, you don't really care about these points. Right, um, but it turns out this set is going to be this set A for a convex problem is going to be convex. I guess that's kind of obvious because it's it's like a multi it's it's the intersection actually it's the intersection of two epigraphs right so it's going to be convex, right? So this is this is the picture, um, and then basically what it says is let me redraw this for a non uh, for a convex set and I'll show you what it looks like. But it should be kind of obvious, right? So what happens is. You have this, and for a convex set, this thing might look like like this or something. I don't know. Let's let's pretend it looks like that, right? Right. So, p star is here. How do you get p star? Well, I ignore what happens over here. I look over here, and I go down as low as I can, and I get this is p star. Okay. So, and now how do I get d star? Well, that's that's simple. I I, I well, I like to think of this. I'm, I'm going to put a line. I, I'm allowed, I think it's like minus 1 over lambda. It doesn't matter. I can change the slope on that. Okay? What I do with that line is I have a point of contact, because I'm really going as far down as I can this way. I have a point of contact. I change lambda, and this is g of lambda. Everybody got that here? This, this intersection. And now the question is, how big can I make g of lambda? Which, by the way, has a name d star. Right? And so the answer is, you rotate this, and like you know, if I if I take lambda, you know, this value of lambda, that's a particularly poor value because this is going to eventually hit this, and it's going you're gonna have a very negative number. Um, if I take lambda way down here, that's a bad value too, and we can see clearly the follow what, what what's actually gonna do the trick. It's gonna be really very cool. Um, what I do is right here, I will find the correct slope is in fact. The tang it's just the tangent to this at that point. And there, p star equals d star. Everybody got it? So it's, kinda, it's actually kind of cool. Also, this hints at lots of other stuff, right? This, this hints at like another topic we're going to look at, which is this. It says, this says that suppose you went back and negotiated the constraint, right? The, the current constraint is, is f1 of x is less than 0, right? But suppose you went back and you said, you know what, I, I can't do it with a, a budget of 50 mil, power budget of 50 milliwatts. I, I simply, I, I can't make, it, it won't clock right, I, I, it's going to use too much area, I don't know what it is, I can't do it. Please give me 55 milliwatts as a budget. That has the effect of, of, of moving this over to here. Because then, then, let's say that says you could have this is less than, you know, something else that's, that's small right there. That's my extra power, right? Okay, now to solve that problem, uh, you can see that the objective is going to go down. I mean, it kind of had to. I just, like, I gave, you started with 50 milliwatt budget, you solved the problem, and I go, you ne went and negotiated, and they said, sure, take 55. Right? And you're like, okay, thanks. Your objective is only going to go down, but here's the cool part. You can see immediately that the amount it goes down is actually extremely well approximated by this Lagrange multiplier. Everybody got that? So we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but that's kind of the idea. So you can even see the Lagrange, the optimal Lagrange multiplier here as a very cool, uh, that's why people call it shadow price. It's basically how much would you pay, how much would you pay in terms of the objective to relax or restrict that constraint, right? So that's, that's the idea. Everybody got the, the idea there? So, I mean, these are, we're going to look at this more carefully in a minute, but that's the idea. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you can also, with this, you can make up one of those sick problems that's convex and has 
a positive duality gap. I'm not going to do it because I just because you shouldn't. This is just one of those things you shouldn't do. This like you could do it, but I'm not going to. So because it's it's kind of silly and all that. But okay. All right. Marching right along, we get to um, this idea of complementary slackness. So let's see what happens if you have zero duality gap and they're achieved, right? So what that means is you find an X um, here. If you have that, if this is a strong duality, so I have X. And then lambda star and nu star are optimal dual variables. By the way, you would call this, you know, optimal dual variables, and you'd call X star comma lambda star nu star. That's primal dual optimal variables. So if you said that, everyone would know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, well, I mean, this is what it means. That's P star. That's D star. But the definition of this is it's the infimum of the Lagrangian over X with the lambda stars in it, right? That, that's fine. But this is the infimum over all X. Well, that's for sure less than or equal to if I plug in X equals X star, because that's one of the things you would infamize over. Okay, so you get this. All right, and now let's take a look at this. X star is optimal, so these are zero, right? The HIs are zero because that's the, pro that's the original problem. So this goes away. These are less than or equal to zero because that's what it means to be feasible. The lambdas are bigger than or equal to zero, and so this sum here is less than or equal to zero, okay? So this thing is less than or equal to that. Oh, but wait a minute, now I have a chain of these things, and that says that actually these are actually equalities, right? Okay, now let's see what that means. Um, we go back to this term, and you know what that means? That means that this term is zero. Now let's talk about that term. It's a sum of products of a non-negative number, lambda i star, times a non-positive number, f i uh, of star. And so actually each term in the sum is less than or equal to zero. Now, if I walk up to you on the street and I say, I have a sum of things, each less than or equal to zero, and the sum is zero, what can you conclude? What's that? What? Well, every single, every single one of them was zero. Because if anyone is non-zero, you're you know, not going to work, right? So, okay, everybody got this? And that tells you that lambda i star, f i star is zero. Um, that's called complementary slackness, right? Because when fi of x is zero, we say that constraint is tight. If fi x is less than zero, we say that constraint is slack. Okay, that's, that's the name. It's, it's good notation. This says if a, constraint is, if a constraint is slack, then for sure the Lagrange multiplier has to be zero. That's what it says. Okay? It also, I mean, and you know, you can work out many ways to say it, right? If, if lambda is, if, if this thing is non-zero, then for sure you have to be tight, okay? So um, actually what's cool is the connection to, you know, these, obviously when you say slack and tight, these are references to mechanical uh, analogs, right? And in fact, for mechanical analogs, it works perfectly. You can read in the book about this where, you know, you minimize the potential energy of something subject to constraints. Uh, for example, if there's a you know if there's a surface and something wants to go that way and it hits it, then it turns out literally you know slack means you're you're uh, you're not touching that boundary. Uh, tight means you're touching it, and then the coolest thing ever happens. It turns out lambda is literally the contact force in newtons, right? So it says if you're not touching or let's take a chain. Right. Let's say I have, a, I, I have two things connected by a cable. It's a mechanical thing. I minimize potential energy and blah, blah, blah. And there it's all hanging. Now it's all hanging in some nice, nice configuration, right? What it says is if, if a cable is slack, their lambda is precisely the tension in the cable. If it's slack, there's no tension. Some will, be, some will actually be not slack. They'll be tight, or in that case, you would say taut, right? And then the tension will be precisely lambda. By the way, I'll, get, I'll be able to show that when we do a little bit later today. That these are, that's literally the tension or the contact force in Newtons. We'll get to that shortly. I mean, if you just know a little bit, which is actually all I know. Yes? How do we know that lambda star and nu star are finite? I can't see the case that when we solve the dual problem, we see that it goes to infinity. Yeah, so yes, that's, that, this is the case where um, 
X star is primal. There exists a, prim a primal optimum and dual optimum. You're talking about cases where there are, where, where like it's, uh, it's an infeasibility problem or something like that, in, in which case you don't have this, right? Like the dual is unbounded or something like that. So this is, this is not that case. That case does come up. Yeah, so in fact, I'll, I'll say something about that case uh, a little bit later. So, okay, everybody got this so far? It's actually all very, it's all pretty cool, right? So, um, okay. Uh, now we march on to something called the KKT or Karush Kun Tucker. This is actually a very sweet story, right? That, um, you, know, I've, you know, Lagrange and others in, in the early 19th century came up with sort of, you know, these, these things that have their names on them. You know, these conditions for minimizing a, a function subject to um, some equality constraints, right? And that's, that's, that's how Lagrange got his name on these things. Okay. Um, that's, and you know, they did it for like one or two and stuff like that and all that. So, you know, it's, it's fine. Um, the extension to um, linear, to inequalities, right? Actually, it, I mean, certainly if you'd asked a mid to late 19th century mathematician to figure out how does it, they would have come up with this. But for whatever reason, it wasn't until like, I don't know, like 1951 that some people at Princeton or whatever, that, that's like Kuhn and Tucker, you know, came up with these. And I mean, it's okay. And you know, they were like, wow, that's cool. Like it's an extension of what Lagrange did. And I don't know, it makes you feel good and all that. Okay, everything's cool. They became, they became called the Kuhn-Tucker condition. So if you look in, I don't know, if you look in uh, uh, papers of a certain era, right? Like maybe from 1960 or 65, there, you will literally see just Kuhn-Tucker conditions, right? Um, anyway, they then later discovered after like a decade or so they discovered a, like a 1938 master's thesis by Karush that everything in it, like everything, it's unpublished, everything was in it, right? So then actually they did the right thing, which is to then popularize that it should be Karush. But actually the real story is that you should never, never, ever pretend that you did something first. Because number one, it's, you know, almost certainly Gauss knew about it. We could start with that <laughs> for sure. And then, you know, I mean, then I don't know, I have, uh, I have friends who remind me that, uh, that, that no, this is not the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, it's the Bhattacharya inequality, which is like 500 years earlier, right? So it's like, anyway, it just, it's, anyway, you should also not hang out with people who say things like that. <laughs> like, I discovered something new, because it's extremely unlikely. All I can say is every time I ever looked into an, an allegation like that, they proved false, so, right? Including, by the way, myself. So it's totally fine. Uh, okay, so anyway, sorry, that was just the story behind this, the name. Okay, so here they are. These are the KKT conditions, and they are, uh, it says, I have a, let, this is a problem with you. I have differentiable functions here. That, that's, that's where it's normally, that they're extensions to non-differential, doesn't matter, but here's the way it works. Uh, and these are gonna end up being conditions that for convex problems are actually the optimality conditions, right? So, but in general, here they are, it says, well, look, if you want to be a candidate for being optimal, you better satisfy the constraints, right? Otherwise, like, you, you're not a candidate, right? So the first one is you have to be feasible, okay? Um, oh, and by the way, what I'm doing is I'm, we're actually looking for, it's, it's conditions that couple x, lambda, and nu, right? The, the other one is, well, look, the dual, I mean, the, if the lambda has entries that are negative, it doesn't make any sense, right? Because it means, you're basically being incented and paid to violate a constraint. And that's why it doesn't make any sense to have lambda i less than zero, uh, any of the lambda i's negative, okay? Um, that's this one. And then finally, you have complementary slackness, right? That's this, this innocent thing that says, if you are, um, you can have a positive Lagrange multiplier for an inequality constraint, if it, only if you're tight. That's what this says, right? And then the final one is this, um, is the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to x vanishes. And that's, that's, that's just this, this condition. This is, this is basically the gradient sub x of the Lagrangian, and that's this, right? And so, I mean, this is very much puts it in the style of calculus, right? Like this, this extends the following, right? If you, if you want to minimize a convex function f0, then the optimality condition is the gradient of f0 is equal to zero, period, if it's differentiable, 
Okay, just that's just the opt, and and that's actually necessary and sufficient, right? So this is this is generalizing that to include constraints. Okay, uh, so this is, and what we've seen is, if you have a convex problem and you have strong uh, duality, actually it turns out if you have any problem, even if it's not convex, if strong duality holds and you and you attain the x star, lambda star, nu star, then these KKT conditions hold, right? So. Not surprise. Oh, and you refer to in a problem, if x lambda nu satisfy the KKT conditions, you that's referred to as a KKT point. That that's that's all it means. And then and then you know in the usual non-convex case, someone says, is it optimal? And you go, might be. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's like look, it's the same thing as like if if you someone says minimize a non-convex function, and you go, you know, I I'll look at gradient equals zero, and you find a point where gradient is equal zero, and someone says, is that Minim, does that minimize your function? And the, the correct and legal answer is like, I don't know, maybe, could, could, you know, possibly, right? And, you know, they, so then they have a different word for it. They call it a stationary point, right? Or something like that. And maybe there's only five stationary points. Then, you know, what, one of them is going to be the best way. Anyway, I, I, I won't go on. So these are, this is KKT conditions. Okay. Now for a convex problem, this is cool. If you satisfy the KKT conditions, then you're optimal, right? And I mean, it's actually really cool. It basically says that, you know, complementary slackness means that when you look back at the Lagrangian, all those Fi lambda i's, they're all zero, right? So in fact, what it says is your objective value if for these three things, right? The objective value at x-tilde is, is also the Lagrangian, right? Um, now the Lagrangian for a convex problem is convex. Because it's F0, which is convex, plus some lambda i, lambda i are non-negative, very important, times Fi, that's, that's convex, right? And then the last one is plus, you know, new transpose and then some, um, some uh, affine functions, right? That's also convex, right? So, but if the va gradient vanishes for a convex problem, it's, it's, it's a minimizer, right? So that says that, uh, that says that when you minimize the Lagrangian, you actually get this. Oh, but then that means this holds. But that's 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 the dual. That's the primal objective and the dual objective. If they're equal, then end of story. X star is act, x tilde is optimal, primal optimal, and lambda star nu star are dual optimal. Ready? Ready? Got this? So, okay. And you know you could get into stuff with Slater's condition. I actually don't want to. I think probably the best way to remember this is simply. KKT conditions are a set of conditions that generalize the silly stuff from calculus. Well, they generalize gradient vanishing as the optimality condition for a convex function. It, it generalizes the 1830 Lagrange multiplier thing. So it says that the thing you were taught mindlessly in your calculus class, which is form this as Lagrangian, take the partial derivative respect to x, set that equal to zero, take the partial derivative respect to these Lagrange multiples, set that equal to zero. And you'd say, okay, cool, I did that. And you go, that's the solution. You know, anyway, that, it says, it justifies, it generalizes that, and now it handles like inequality constraints, right? So th probably that's the best way to think of, of, of the KKT conditions. Okay. So, you know, there's a handful of problems where you can actually solve things analytically. I'll just, just, I'll just quickly go over one example. It's a famous one from communications. Um, and uh, let me just give a little background on the problem. Um, so the background on the problem is that I have a, a, a wireless device. In fact, it's actually happening all around us right now. So you have, you have a wireless device. What I do is I want to communicate, you know, to another terminal over there. Um, I divide that into like 512 channels. Each channel will have its own signal to noise ratio because other people are transmitting and weird other stuff is going down like that. That's a signal to noise ratio. And then the question is, which of those channels should I transmit on and at what powers? and to maximize my bit rate. Again, you know, if you're not into communications, you don't need to know this. Um, and so the, this is gonna be the uh, log of xi plus alpha. xi is gonna be like the power I put into channel i. And this is actually gonna be, with some constants out in front, it's gonna be the bandwidth. It's the number of bits per second I can pump down channel i. Again, if, if you know, um, actually, how many people here have taken like information theory or communication class or anything like that? That's all, okay. It's cool, fine, okay. It, that's it. So, so this basically says, figure out the channel, the powers to transmit on all your channels to maximize your total bandwidth, right? Um, 
And uh, anyway, so here you write down the KKT conditions and they actually look like this, right? And this is one of those, you know, extremely few problems where you can actually just sit out, get, get out your 19th century pencil and paper and actually just solve the KKT conditions, right? So, I mean, actually, I, I, won't, I won't go into that except I'll, I'll give you the interpretation. Um, people figured this out in the 70s or something and they were like, this is awesome. And, okay, it, it's actually kind of silly because even armed with the analytical formula, a numerical method will compute it just as fast. Not only that, you could add other constraints to it and stuff like that, and it'll still be just as fast. Anyway, so people who celebrate these, I mean, it, look, it's nice to have an analytical formula for something, but it is kind of silly in this day and age, right? So, okay, so here's the, um, here, here's the, the idea is these, these, are the, uh, these are the alphas, right? So if alpha is big, it means that there's a lot of noise on that channel. Um, and then what it says is this, this height, the dark height, is actually the optimal, the power you should transmit at. And then what it does is it says flood this thing to a certain level until you have like one unit or whatever this is, one unit of, of uh, water in here, right? When you do, here's what you'll find out. This channel, it's, it's, not, it's got a lot of noise and you should just put a little bit of power on it. This channel is so bad, you should put no power on it, right? You know, we knew we were gonna use this one. That's the cleanest channel you have and you put a lot of power on. Anyway, it's, it's fine. Have, did you, did, for the people who raised their hand before, did you see water filling in that class? You, you did. Cool, okay. Did they know it was a convex problem? <laughs> yeah, I think so. They did? Okay, yeah, well, okay, that's, that's progress. Good. good, good for them. They're, they're, these are my friends, where was that? Uh, at Caltech. At Caltech, yeah, they would know. <laughs> okay, fine, that's fine, okay, good, fine, okay. Um, okay, now we get to a very cool and incredibly practical and useful uh, application of duality, right? So, um, okay, so here it is. Um, you start, here's your original problem like this, right? And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna imagine perturbing the constraints. Perturbing the constraints means we're gonna change the right-hand side. So here, I'm gonna put a UI, for the, these object, for the inequality constraints and a VI for these. Super interesting. So let me say, and there's lots of language people would use to describe this. If UI is positive, it says you have relaxed the ith constraint. Everyone understand that? Because you relaxed it because you made it sort of easier, more X's satisfy it, right? So it's basically, that's what happened when I had a 50 milliwatt budget. I went back and said, can't do it, can't design it, sorry, I need more power. And then they came back and they said, cool, you get 55. Everybody following? So that's called, and then when you, uh, when you make UI negative, that's called like restricting. That's a restriction, right? Because when I said I wanted five more milliwatts, presumably there's an overall budget somewhere of power. Somebody went, whoever my manager was, went to someone designing another part of the system and said, hey, can I steal five milliwatts from you? Everybody following this? And they were like, I guess, you know, I'm, it's not gonna be as good. They we're like, well, we know it's not as good because we're taking some power away from you, but okay, we'll do it. And we'll remember this at bonus time. I just, something like that, right? Everybody, okay, so that's, that, that's how this might work. Okay, um, equality constraints, it's also super duper interesting, a perturbation. So here's an example, which is extremely practical and universal. Uh, Let's suppose we're optimizing an energy system. So power flows across, let's say, the ca entire California grid. Some of the equality constraints basically are flow conservation. Like you, you point to some place, you know, some substation, and you know, it says basically, you know, the sum of the powers coming in from the 115 kilovolt lines is gonna equal the sum of the powers going out over these 15 kilovolt, uh, distribution lines. Everybody, that's, that's power conservation. Everybody got that? Okay. So then what happens if you perturb, if zero, so zero here means power coming in is equal to power going out. If you, per, if you perturb it, if I put a number there like plus, you know, plus, it actually is weird. It basically means roll a truck out over to that substation, hook up a wire to it, 
and either suck some extra power out or pump some in. Everybody got that? Because that's what it means, right? It says, in that case, you're saying, no, no, the total, the total power, you know, the net power, well, let's say it's the net, net power going into a node in a power system. Normally that should be zero, right? But if I say, no, it can be like a megawatt or something like that. If it's a megawatt, that means I've changed, VI is non-zero. And what that means is, um, the sum of the powers of, what that means is I'm sucking out one megawatt from that node. Everybody got that? Okay, so actually keep that idea in mind. So I, this is just to say what, you know, what perturbations are. And perturbations are obvious in other, in other areas as well, right? What, what, what they mean, but they always mean something sort of interesting. Okay, so we're interested in, in, in this perturbed problem. And we're actually, we're super interested in what happens with the optimal, val what happens to the optimal value when you have non-zero UIs and Vs, right? So let's talk about that. In this case, if I increase UI, you tell me what happens to the optimal value of this thing. If, I, if, if the UIs are positive, what? Okay, damn. It's gotta go down. Yeah, well, okay, it could stay the same, right? Um, I, by the way, it would stay the same if all of the inequality, if that inequality constraint was slack. You agree with that, right? Like you'd say, I had a 50, I had a, you know, 50 milliwatt thing. I designed my, ch I'm, and I'm, I, I just did my power analysis. I'm coming in at 48 milliwatts. Everybody following this? And then somebody comes to me and says, fantastic news. I've got the best news ever for you. Remember I said you had 50 milliwatt budget? I'm giving you 55. And what is the consequence in that case? There's no consequence at all. You're like, I don't need it because I'm coming in at 48. I don't even need your stupid 50. Here, take two back. Okay, don't say that. But you could say something like that if you wanted, and that would be completely reasonable. Everybody following this? Okay. So, uh, and if UI is negative, so you tighten the constraint, what happens to the optimal value of this problem? It's gonna go up. Once again, if the constraint is slack, it might not go up at all. Because they go, yep, sorry, I'm, I'm dropping you from 50 milliwatt budget to 49. And you go, well, okay, whatever. They go, aren't you gonna redesign your, 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 your part? And you go like, no, because my current part's only coming in at 48. Everybody following this, right? So, but if it were tight, you're gonna pay for it, including quite possibly, it'll become infeasible. Everybody, that, that, that can happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that is a, that's a strong form of an increase in P star, is P star will become infinity, right? So can happen. Okay, so uh, what happens here is if you work out the dual of this problem, that, that's that, and here's the dual here. And this is only because we've, uh, we, 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 we've shifted these things like that. Um, so we're, inter we're interested in, in what this, uh, oh, by the way, if there's like only just one of these, then the way you do this is you'd, you'd just plot it, right? That, and that would be called a trade-off curve, right? Like suppose, I don't know, here, this is power. Then you simply resynthesize the circuit with power budgets running from, with UI run, whatever, with a, with a limit running from 10 milliwatts to 80. And you get a curve and someone would say, what's that? And you go, that's the optimal trade-off curve of my objective with respect to the power I am allocated. Everybody got that? So you do something like that. That's, so there's just one. And then that's literally just this thing here. That's, that's, this, that's when there's only just one variable, right? And it requires you to solve a whole bunch of problems, right? So the, the, no problem. Okay. Um, but here we're going to get a lot of information actually for local information for free. Um, and it's this. So it turns out um, that weak duality here just gives you kind of a very cool inequality. It says that, that the perturbed optimal cost is bigger than or equal to the unperturbed optimal cost minus these things. And this is weird. This is global. This is not local. It's not approximate. It is global. And in fact, it kind of makes sense because look at this here. This, this curve, that's P star. This is P star of U, this curve. This is U, right? And this, this, this curve is P star. And what this says, this thing here is exactly the right-hand side there. It's that, it's that, it's essentially this tangent plane there. And what it says, and you can see it's actually kind of correct. This says, if I tighten your budget, so I, I, I have UI negative, you go over here, 
This says it's got to go up at least this amount. And, and of course, it's convex, so it goes up more than that amount. Everybody got that? Including, by the way, it could go up to plus infinity, right? Um, on the other hand, if I give you more budget, if I, if, I, if I say here, have some more resources, you'll see this makes a prediction that the objective is going to go down. The amount the objective goes down can't be more than that, but it could be less. Everybody got this? Kind of, okay. So this is super useful and it's a weird and asymmetric. So you need to spend some time, you know, basically go to a quiet place and look at this because it's got all sorts of implications. Some are obvious, but it, it's, it's weird and asymmetric because of this inequality. So it basically says, if I have a large, if I have a constraint that has a large inequality constraint with a large Lagrange multiplier, then, and you have to listen to English, it's because it's going to be very carefully uh, worded, right? It says basically, in that case, if you restrict that problem, then your optimal objective will for sure go up, right? And someone would say, did you want to re resolve it? And you go, well, number one, no thanks, because it takes me 12 hours to synthesize the circuit. Number, But number two, you don't have to. And, and you'd say, it's going to go up at least by this amount. And someone would say, could it go up more? And you go, yeah, sure, it could go up more, can't, but it can't go up less. They'd say, could it go up to plus infinity? And the answer is, yep, it could. It absolutely could. Everybody following this? Um, now, on the other hand, it's asymmetric. If lambda, star, if lambda i star is large, and you then I say to you, I'm going to give you some more resources. First of all, you should be happy. Okay, But when you do that, and I ask you what's going to happen to your p star, I mean, you could say a couple, I mean, let's be very careful about what we're saying. What you would, here would be the correct and careful way to say it. You'd say, first of all, number one, thank you for the additional resources. That's very important. You have to say that first. Okay, so you say that. Then here's what happens. This is real. Then they'd say, uh, great, you know, uh, use it well. And you go, oh, I will. And they'd say, what's going to happen to your objective? And they'd say, great quest. Good news. Lambda star is positive. It's actually, you'd say, well, I predict it's going to go down quite a bit. And they go, well, what do you mean predict? I just gave you some more resources. And then you'd say, okay, I predict it. It probably will, but I can't guarantee it because the actual decrease might be less than what I predict. Everyone got that? And in fact, you could easily imagine, I'll, I'll draw a, a sick and I'll draw a sad case here that goes like this here. Here's a, here's a sad case. Um, you do this like this, and then this thing go, looks like this, right? And yeah, that's good enough, right? And then it just flattens out like right there. Okay, so here's your Lagrange multiplier, right? Here's, here's your optimal Lagrange multiplier. It's pretty hefty. And so whoever is allocating you more resources is expecting your objective to go down if they give you this much more. They're expecting it to go down to this. But what you can see here is it doesn't. Because you didn't know it, but you were just barely at the limit when getting additional resources was not going to help you. Everybody? Got this? So these are the, anyway. So these are weird and asymmetric and very cool and all that kind of stuff. And also, this is now unbelievably. Uh, this is super useful because, as I said before, when you solve a problem, whether you like it or not, you're going to get optimal Lagrange multipliers. Okay. So that's and th this is awesome because it allows you to do. In fact, I'll I'll, yeah, I'll I'll tell you a story about this, this is from a long time ago. But yeah, people doing circuit design, right? You have 50 constraints, right? You'd say, oh, my phase margin has to exceed this. You know, I, I need to be able to do this. My power should be less than that. My area should be less than that. This should be that, blah, blah, blah. You know, my swing should be this. My, what is it? My, you know, third order distortion has to be less than that. You have all these things, right? And so you, you design it, right? Out of your 50 constraints, it's quite typical that only 10 or 15 are going to be tight. Everybody following this? Then the question is, like, well, how tight are they? Like, and I mean, here's the, the Boolean idea of tightness goes like this. It says, you were allocated 50 milliwatts. How much did you use? 50. You're tight. I insisted on a phase margin of 120 degrees. What's your phase margin? 120. Right? Something like that, right? So these are tight. Um, but then the question is, you'd want to know which of these 
like how to, let, let's do, let, let, let's get a little bit more sophisticated and say, which one, which, which are more tight than others? Everybody following this? And somebody want to tell me how to do it? You just look at the Lagrange multipliers. So, so if I have a 50 milliwatt, I'm assuming everything is like whatever, you know, on the similar scale, right? But aside from that, if I have a power thing, it's tight. I'm using all my budget, but my Lagrange multiplier is really small. And I have another constraint, which is tight, but with a really big Lagrange multiplier. Then what it tells me is, yeah, the first one, you would say it's tight, but it's not that tight. Everybody see what I'm saying? I mean, actually, this is not, this is like in a mechanical system, right? It would be, um, you'd say, yeah, it's up against the wall, but there's not very much contact force there. Or that cable is taut, but the te there's only like five Newtons on, of tension on it. Everybody see what I'm saying? So, oh, by the way, now I can, now, now that you know this, we, I can say, I can describe the mechanical thing well, right? If you minimize uh, the total energy in a configuration of some mechanical thing, subject to, and you have constraints. The constraint says that, for example, uh, you know, two points uh, can't be more than a meter apart because there's a cable connecting them. Or another one says there's a floor and you can't go, you can't have, you know, X1, maybe a position go, they, it can't go below the floor. Everybody follow this? Okay, so then the Lagrange multipliers for those constraints are actually precisely forces because it's the partial, it's the partial derivative of the energy, the optimal energy with respect to when you perturb a constraint like that, it's basically saying I could move the floor down or something like that. And that is actually literally the physical units are Newtons. So, okay, that ever, ever make sense? So it's kind of cool. So anyway, this is, so this is like, these are all super useful uh, stuff. Um, I remember we made a tool for doing this for circuit designers and then ended up, you had 50 constraints and we, did things like we colored, you know, one column would be budget, the other would say design. So you'd see 50-50 means you're at your budget. We colored them red if the Lagrange multiplier was large, orange if it was modest, yellow, and it's just, and there's no color at all if it's slack. Everybody got this? Anyway, so circuit designers were like, that is awesome. This, one is, this is new. Like when, how, how many, how long, since when have people known about this? This is amazing. And I said, well, here's a hint. These are called Lagrange multipliers, um, and you know, and he died in 1840. Anyway, so something like that. Anyway, so, okay, that's just. I'm just saying this. There's a lot of. It is all quite useful. Um, okay. Um, now we get to the local sensitivity. Yeah. So I, I actually jumped ahead, but that's okay. That's fine. Um, so assuming p star is differentiable, which by the way it often is not. Let's just let's just say that. But assuming it were, you get these, and these are the things most people think about. You get the um, you get that the optimal Lagrange multipliers are very cool partial derivatives. They are like, for example, this one is the the lambda i star is the partial derivative of it's actually the partial derivative of the optimal cost with respect to tightening that constraint with a minus sign in front of it. Because if you tighten the constraint, cost is going to go up, and then you put a minus sign and you get something. That, anyway, that's it. So it's very cool, right? Um, so that's the, that's the picture. Um, now I'll go back to the energy example. Uh, like I have a, a, the, a grid, right? Um, then what I do is I look at an equality constraint and that equality constraint says at that node, the power going in balances the power going out. Everybody got that? And by the way, that's all, an equality constraint is always tight. And I get a Lagrange multiplier when I solve my, op my, my optimization problem, right? I get a Lagrange multiplier. And then the Lagrange multiplier is super interesting because it tells you the partial derivative of the total system cost with respect to perturbing that equality constraint, but perturbing an equality constraint, which is a balance constraint that says all the, you know, everything coming in balances everything going out, basically says it's doing the thought experiment, please go hook up some wires and either suck some energy in, suck some energy out of the system there or pump some in, right? That's what it means to perturb that equality constraint. What this says, what the Lagrange multiplier tells you then is the increase or decrease in system cost, overall system cost, if you do that. And so in energy, these are called locational marginal prices 
because the cost, the objective is in dollars. It's the operating cost for your 3000 generators or whatever, something like that. Everybody got this? Right. So this is, you can, you can look that up. You can go, if you want, you can go, if you want, you can even find the locational marginal prices in Texas or in California. You specify the node and the hour or the 15 minute re and you'll get the price. It'll be, you know, $83 per megawatt hour. So everybody follows? So it's just, and it's just, it's just from this and it all makes perfect sense. It's really cool, I think. So um, also this is good for like resource allocation, right? So I'm doing, re I'm running a data center. I've got, you know, whatever, 350 different job classes and I want to allocate resources to them, like IO bandwidth, numbers of cores, you know, also whatever it is, these kinds of things, right? And I want to allocate it to them. They're all doing different things. Then you get a really cool thing where you ask, if I, I would ask you, how much better will you do if I, if I give you more cores or more IO bandwidth, right? Or something like that. Um, and these would, these literally tell you that these would, these would work out to the prices of the resources in the data center. So, and it, that's why, in a lot of fields, people refer to Lagrange multipliers or dual variables as prices or shadow prices. M makes sense? Which is, I think is really good, good words for this, right? I guess people in mechanical engineering don't because it's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to say. When, when you hit, for example, I don't know, it seems to me these are just two forces. These are just contact forces <laughs> um, and I, they're not prices, right? Like you say, I'd pay more. And you're like, dude, that's a concrete floor. So uh, you, anyway, so. Anyway, th those, those are the main areas where people encounter all these things and have names for them and stuff. Okay, um, we're gonna uh, do. Uh, we're gonna look at one more one more topic. It's actually it's super interesting, um, and I will I'll, I'll show you what it is. Um, and first, let let me start with what the the issue is. Right. So, um, remember that we have uh, problem reformulations. Right. You you take a you take a problem. And then you have an equivalent problem. And for us that, you know, in computer science, you call that a reduction. Um, we just call it an equivalent problem. And what it means is you, uh, if you can solve the other problem, then there's a way to reconstruct the solution of the other one, right? So there, you know, there, and some of these transformations are obvious, some aren't, by the way, but most are, uh, you know, simple ones. In fact, if you're, anyone's curious what CVX Pi does, it does absolutely nothing but this. It starts with your problem, it creates a new equivalent problem, and another one, and another one, another one, another one. And then 42 steps later, you arrive at a problem which a solver can handle. Then you throw it to the solver, and then you pull it all back because every one of those reduction methods has a retrieval method associated with it, which tells you, tells you if you solved the, the thing that I reduced this to, how would I solve the original problem? Everybody, I mean, you didn't need to follow that, but if you're just curious, that's what it does. If you know about compilers, that's a rewriting system. Right, that's, that's how a, a, one brand, uh, one, one type of compiler works that way, right? It takes your source code, generates new source code that it can prove is semantically equivalent, right? So for example, it might reorder some operations, but it'll only do that if it knows that it's gonna preserve the semantics of your original program, right? And you can do that, for example, if they don't have anything to do with each other, if they're, you know, like no one writes on some memory at the, you know, that kind of thing. That's how, anyway, you just do that kind of stuff. So you just do lots and lots of rewriting and then you end up with, and they do a lot, lot of modern things do exactly that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, okay, so here's, some, here's what I was gonna say. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll do the main thing yesterday, but I'll just set the whole thing, the, the picture up now. So you start with a problem P, right? And then I'm gonna change it uh, to uh, a new one. This is equivalent, right? And this could be something really dumb, like eliminating equality constraints, adding equality constraints. I don't know, it's adding slack variables is something, right? Okay, and so, you know, you can think of these as equivalent, right? And I can form a Lagrange dual here, and I get this, right? Okay, well, but I can form the Lagrange dual of this thing, and that should be, you know, well, I'll call that, whoops, D tilde star or something like, like that, or no, no, I'll just call it D tilde, sorry, there we go like that, right? And so then you'd say, look, these two problems are intimately connected because they're equivalent. These two are intimately connected because that's the Lagrange dual of this one. This one's intimately connected because it's Lagrange dual of that one, right? Okay, so then I wanna ask, what about these two? 
And here's what you, I mean, they are obviously closely related, right? Well, they all have the same optimal value. I mean, assuming there's whatever strong duality, right? Because this has the same optimal value as that. That's, that's what it means to be uh, an equipment. You know, this has the same as that of strong duality. And blah, blah. So this is related to that one, certainly through this chain of three. But what you really want to do is draw this in um, and say that there's some connection between them. Um, so that sounds great. And, oh, and by the way, people trained in math will have a huge urge. If you, if you show this picture to someone in math, their motor cortex will start twitching <laughs> because they want to write in and they want to make that a commutative diagram. So they, they will, it's true, don't deny it, right? So if you see that and you show, if you go to the math department, they're going to go like, they're going to be, they're going to be looking for chalk, okay, not uh, this thing. But when they get the chalk, they're going to draw in a line there. Anyway, so this is just the setup, and I think we'll quit for today.